is an EU funded project and it connects students and farmers and private companies and organizations to work towards the development of a green economy. And we are, apart from webinars such as this, we are showcasing fossil free technologies. Uh, we are developing the education for tomorrow's farmers and of course, then focusing quite a lot on biochar, and that's what brings us here today. Uh, so the program for today is that we will hear three presentations from three distinguished researchers in the biochar field, and they will each represent uh, Sweden, Denmark and Norway. And um, then uh, that will take the better part of the first hour and then we will have uh, time for comments and questions and to get answers to your questions. So please, uh, whenever you hear something interesting or have a question, put it in the chat and we will pick them up at the end of uh, the webinar. Uh, there has also been a slight change in the program. Uh, we uh, have, instead of Adam O'Toole, we will hear about the Norwegian perspective from Daniel Rasse, uh, but otherwise uh, there should be the same program as you have seen in the emails and the invitation. Uh, so with that, uh, I would uh, uh, employ you again to turn off your video and your audio. Uh, so we have a, a nice recording of the presentations and I uh, uh, ask you, Cecilia Sundberg, maybe you could uh, take the floor and uh, start by presenting uh, yourself and your topic. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Cecilia Sundberg and I will talk about biochar research and applications in Sweden. Um, I will try to make an overview, but it will be naturally biased from my perspective. So that's why it's good to to share who, who I am and, and my um, entry point and interest in biochar. Uh, I'm associate professor in bioenergy systems at the Department of Energy and Technology at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences in Uppsala, Sweden. Um, and my background is in environmental engineering. Uh, so I've come into this because of an interest in better technologies for improving the environment. Uh, and that's both in terms of, of developing and implementing such technologies, um, but also in understanding what are really the environmental impacts. Uh, and with that, life cycle is a methodology, life cycle assessment is a methodology that I've been working with for several years. And before coming into biochar, I have a background in organic waste, in agriculture, and, um, um, and in bioenergy. Uh, and there's been a lot of focus on, on climate, but not only climate, but also other environmental impacts. Uh, and I've been working with biochar since 2014 uh, in projects uh, both in Kenya and in Sweden. Um, and with that comes my presentation today. Um, I will start by talking about research and innovation projects. Some, um, some projects that I am aware of or have been involved in. Uh, and then also uh, towards the end, talk about uh, applications, what's happening on the ground in the biochar sector in Sweden. Um, and these research projects, some of them I will go a bit deeper in the coming um, part of the presentation. Some are just mentioned here in this list uh, of overall questions that are being asked and, and answered in these different projects. Um, and first is about the, the climate benefit of biochar. Is there really a, a climate benefit uh, and how large is that? Uh, and that's something that we've been digging into um, in a large, well, 
um, in a research project in the past few years. Um, how can biochar products and markets extend, expand sustainably? That's a larger project and I will mention that more also. Um, another topic is can biochar improve contaminated soil? Uh, and that was investigated in a smaller project as a starting point. Uh, there are many contaminants, biochar have different properties, so you don't get a full answer to this question by one, one research project. But there's definitely opportunities for some contaminants uh, under some um, uh, conditions. Um, how can biochar be used in water treatment? Uh, there are several researchers uh, at Uppsala University and Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences that are looking into this, um, both in decentralized wastewater treatment uh, and in stormwater management. So related to urban uses of biochar, also the, the um, the runoff water in the cities uh, and how can biochar um, help with contamination in that context. Um, can biochar be beneficial in animal husbandry? Uh, there is a project at the Swedish University of, Life, uh, of Agricultural Sciences uh, on this, uh, focusing on, on milk production and looking at biochar both in, uh, in the feed, in, um, in the cows, in the stomach, and in the manure management. That's an ongoing research project. Um, how stable is biochar in agricultural soil in the long term? Uh, it's one of the questions of interest for the climate benefit of biochar. Uh, that we are specifically going to dig in deeper into in uh, a recently started project. Um, and my final example of research uh, and development projects is uh, on how uh, the climate benefits of biochar can be certified and traded. Um, and that project is in my next slide, and that is Cecilia, who's hosting this webinar, is also leading that project. Um, so she will be able to tell more about it, but it's about certification of uh, the climate um, benefits of biochar. Um, so this uh, project is um, that I mentioned uh, on actually de developing products and markets for biochar. And this project involves uh, many stakeholders in biochar sector in Sweden, uh, working together with researchers to understand and to resolve issues so that various waste biomasses uh, can be paralyzed and transformed into um, productive and pro profitable and environmentally beneficial products. Um, and that's uh, for product use in agriculture, in urban uh, applications, in water treatment, and also considering the energy that is a co-product of biochar production. And this project is in its um, third phase now, so there is already results from previous phases and more will come in the coming years. But I, I can recommend their web page um, uh, for more information uh, about this. Um, then it's our research project on um, biochar doing systems analysis in order to understand the energy balance and climate change impact of biochar systems in Sweden. 
Um, and this work is very much the, the work of Elias Assi, who did his PhD on this um, in um, KTH, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, uh, and finalized earlier this year. And the figure here is a summary of, of our system perspective on biochar, looking at the biomass that becomes biochar through pyrolysis, the, the biochar products, how they are used, uh, and also the energy uh, that uh, is a co-product from pyrolysis. And we have a lot produced, not just the scientific papers, but also several webinars uh, for various audiences. Um, so you will get uh, the links to that also uh, will be made available. Uh, so I've just selected a very few issues. Um, this, in this project, we did life cycle assessment of various biochar systems relevant for Sweden. Uh, first one was on large scale. If we do this in the district heating in Stockholm, produce a lot of biochar used in, in farms, in, in milk farms, um, and uh, calculated then energy balances, climate impacts of this. Uh, second case is a small farm case where biochar is produced while heating the, the buildings of the farm. Uh, third case is contaminated soil using urban waste to produce biochar, mixing it with contaminated soils. Um, and the fourth case focuses on these applications that are more, most common in Sweden today and where the bio biochar market is really uh, developing. And that's on urban uses in tree planting, in soils, uh, in green roofs, um, but also um, as an additive in, in um, concrete. Um, and the case there was the city of Uppsala and new areas that are being planned for um, construction. Um, so th these cases have all been published and are available, uh, but I will just talk about our conclusions at a very general level. Um, and first, the farming perspective, since uh, uh, um, um, yeah, um, that uh, if you're a farmer and interested in producing biochar, that should be considered first on farms that rely on fossil fuel boilers and want to change them, uh, or if there is another old inefficient technology that needs to be replaced. And one key aspect is to have local and long-term availability of biomass. Because with pyrolysis and biochar production, you will use about twice as much biomass as if it's combusted only for energy uh, to provide the same uh, heat need. Um, and one finding from our case study is that dimensioning is a key factor to really have the right size of the reactor for the heat production um, because that will have a large effect on, on uh, how many hours it can run and how much biochar you will produce, but also then the economy and the environmental performance. Overall conclusions from this is that yes, biochar can efficiently contribute to climate change mitigation. Uh, but energy systems are crucial um, and they should be rather decarbonized. If, if you're still dependent very much on fossil fuels, it can be more efficient to use um, the biomass fully for energy purposes. The biochar stability has to be high so that it remains in the soil for a long time and is not degraded. And biochar should be used purposefully, and I'll come to that. Um, meaning that 
there should be additional um, benefits of the biochar in terms of increasing yields or uh, reducing other greenhouse gas emissions or replacing other uh, environment, uh, um, replacing other materials that have environmental impacts. Um, and there should uh, be direct benefits from biochar uh, in order to justify the increased use of biomass and potential burden shifts uh, causing other environmental impacts. Uh, so you shouldn't only have uh, carbon dioxide removal as a driver for uh, doing biochar. Um, and life cycle assessment is not a perfect tool that will give you all kind of answers, but it does provide information about the climate impact of specific cases and therefore can, can guide decisions decision making. Our next project, uh, we will look deeper into the aspects of biochar stability uh, in order to su support reliable carbon removal uh, and understand better how stable biochar is in Swedish agricultural soil. And this project has just started. We will uh, be working on this for the coming four years. Um, when it comes to biochar production in, in Sweden, we now have um, more than a dozen plants um, and they are at various scales, not very large, but uh, there is a variety. Um, and shown here are examples um, from the first plant in Stockholm in 2016. We've had new plants coming. Several of them are on farms like Lindeborgs, Jelmsäter, Fräkentorp. Um, others are uh, companies in the green sector like Skånefrö and Vegtech, uh, who are doing this as an integrated part uh, of their production. Also, what we've seen now are waste management companies coming in, building plants, uh, biochar plants to treat some uh, specific uh, wastes. Um, and also other companies who are interested in biochar and setting up biochar production um, as part of, of uh, their uh, climate work, but also uh, for the product as such. And for biochar applications in Sweden, the market has really um, grown and it's been, become established for urban areas. Tree planting, green roofs, landscaping soils. Especially tree planting, the city of Stockholm have been pioneers. Uh, they have long experience of this now, and it's it's not just piloting, but it's really part of their everyday practice when uh, when planting new trees in street environments, especially that they really see the benefits of biochar and have developed a system for for using biochar uh, in the plant beds. But there are also new products uh, related to the urban um, development uh, of a bio biochar use in urban areas. And that's biochar in concrete, and uh, that's water filters with biochar. And then we have uh, a little bit of agricultural use. Um, there is some experimentation, not that much, not so much research has um, been going on. Um, and one key area there is to combine biochar with manure. Um, and currently uh, the demand um, mainly then from, from urban applications is larger than the production of biochar in Sweden. So biochar is being imported, but this is also a reason that there are uh, quite a few actors who are looking into um, biochar production. 
And as my final slide, I just want to promote the Nordic Biochar Network, uh, where we uh, are providing a, a platform for connecting stakeholders across the Nordic and Baltic, Baltic countries. Um, and we transfer knowledge and research results. And you're very welcome to sign up. Membership is free and um, there's a lot of um, knowledge sharing there. Here are some links to research projects uh, with information. This is all in Swedish, but there's actually some information in English also on these links. Um, and that was all that I had planned to say. So thank you very much. Thank you, Cecilia. That was a great overview of what is going on in Sweden uh, and uh, of um, and we see the audience. <laughs> Thank you very much. They are applauding you, and I can't. Uh, I agree. Uh, and uh, we do have one. I mean, we we will do the big questions and the discussions afterwards. But we have one specific questions about a uh, question about Lindeborg, uh, the farm. Do they use only the heat, or do they have this combined heating and power system in place? Do you know that? So that is only for heat. Uh, there's no electricity production there. Mm. Is that the most common in Sweden that it's usually only heat or do you know of anyone who's using power as well, electricity or something like that? Yeah, I don't know anybody producing electricity, so it's it's heat that is in focus. Mm. That is my um, my feeling too, actually. Well, thank you, Cecilia. We will hear back from you in the discussion in the end. And now I wish to uh, uh, welcome Julia Raveni. Uh, you are presenting the Danish perspective of this. So please, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. So let me just start sharing my screen. OK, that should work now. If you can confirm, you see my slides Perfect. full screen. We do. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, thank you for inviting me to present here today. Uh, I'm happy to try and give uh, an overview about what is happening in Denmark around the field of biochar production news and, and research also. So I will start by saying a few words about me. So my name is Giulia Ravenni and um, I work at the Technical University of Denmark where I'm currently a postdoc, um, yes, in the Department of Chemical Engineering. I have a background in mechanical and energy engineering. So it's actually a bit different from uh, Cecilia and also from many others working in uh, in in the biochar field, but it's uh, it, as we know it's a very multidisciplinary field. So I have uh, um, completed my PhD degree in 2019 uh, at the Department of Chemical Engineering at the DTU, and uh, I have worked on a thesis studying the use of uh, residual gasification char in the treatment of uh, producer gas. So it was more of a technical application of biochar, let's say, but I have started um, getting more interest into the topic of biochar as a, also um, for other uses, for example, in agriculture and so on. So during my postdoctoral years and until today, I have worked uh, in within different research projects. And mainly I have worked with the production and um, of biochar at lab and pilot scale uh, on the characterization of the biochar for different applications, depending again on the project. So ranging from agriculture to adsorption um, from water or gases, for example, and also as an animal feed additive. Since 2019, I'm also the secretary of the Nordic Biochar Network, which Cecilia uh, mentioned at the end of her presentation. Yes, so that's uh, me. I will uh, um, I will give you an overview of what's happening in Denmark, starting from the um, biochar production. So uh, giving an overview of the technology providers that we have uh, in the country. Um, we don't have any um, like um, 
production, ongoing production at the moment, but we have many companies that are actually starting up and starting to actually sell plants. So I will talk about them later on in the presentation. I will also uh, talk about the research landscape, uh, not only uh, within DTU, but also uh, within other universities in Denmark. With, um, with them, we, we collaborate a lot when it comes, for example, to agricultural use um, of, um, of biochar as we, uh, as a chemical engineering uh, department, we focus a lot on the technology development and optimization and so on, so more on the technical part. I will also say a few words in the end about the uh, about pyrol the role of pyrolysis in the Danish climate roadmap to 2000 2030. So these are the main uh, technology providers for pyrolysis and biochar productions that I mentioned earlier. Uh, they are Stisdal, Aquagreen, uh, Mesh Makes, and Flix Pyrolysis. Um, three of them uh, are actually uh, working in close collaboration with, uh, with us at DTU, and they are using technologies that have been developed at the department. So, yeah, we collaborate continuously on, on different projects. Um, I will start by saying a few words about Aquagreen who is a, a company who has developed a, a steam drying and pyrolysis system. So it is a combined system that is actually meant uh, for uh, uh, feedstock like sewage sludge or different types of uh, very wet feedstock. Um, so they have been uh, already they have been already selling some plants and they are currently installing two plants treating wastewater sludge. Um, at Odsherred Municipality and at Van Center Sud near Odense. So here in the slide you can read a little bit about the capacity of these plants, how big they are. Um, they, pro they foresee to install uh, six more plants, about six more plants in, in the country in uh, this year. Um, they also have been commissioned a one megawatt pyrolysis unit in South Africa. Um, Stistal is also another company that is involved in the development of pyrolysis technology. Um, they are working with a different type of technology. It's a, an updraft pyrolysis system, which is meant to process uh, a different type of feedstock that would be mainly um, agricultural residues in the form of pellets. So they are now focusing on straw pellets, uh, wheat straw pellets, and uh, biogas fibers residues, which are dried and pelletized. Um, both of these feedstock are largely available in Denmark today, so they also allow to plan for the building of large-scale pyrolysis plants. That's what the company is focusing on. Um, they have a pilot plant, 200 kilowatt uh, pilot plant at Riso. They have built another one uh, in Denmark. Um, they are uh, also building a 2 megawatt plant uh, at the Green Labs Kive which has been started, I believe, this week. And uh, this year and next year, they plan for uh, upscaling even more to plant size of 10 to 20 megawatt. Uh, then we have MeshMakes, um, which is also uh, a spin-off, let's say, from DTU. They, um, they are actually working with both pyrolysis and gasification technologies. Um, they have some pyrolysis plants, in, plants installed, but not actually in Denmark, but in India, because they are, um, they are a company that is present both in India and in Denmark. Um, they are on the gasification side, they are using the two-stage uh, design that has been developed uh, in the last decade or more. Uh, DTU is the known, also known as the Viking gasifier. Um, again, which is a double stage gasifier. And they have a pilot plant, a 100 kilowatt pilot plant uh, that is a DTU, and they operate it um, to test, for example, different feedstocks. They also test um, at, at DTU, uh, our campus at Riso, they also test for oil condensation in this, uh, in this uh, two stage gasifier pilot plant. Finally, there is also Frix uh, Pyrolysis, which is a company that I know a bit less because we do not work directly with them. So they do, they do not have any um, link with DTU. 
uh, but they are also developing and selling pyrolysis systems uh, focused on biochar production and um, they have been focusing on the pyrolysis of uh, chicken manure and uh, as far as I know they have been installing uh, their first plant and sh that should have been started up in November 2021 but I wasn't able to get more updated news about this, so I'm not uh, exactly sure uh, what's happening there, but that was the plan. So they hope to use uh, the biochar as, um, as a valuable uh, material, both as for phosphorus fertilizer, but also in concrete production, and of course for carbon sequestration. So when it comes to the actual uh, biochar use in Denmark today, uh, there is not much to say, unfortunately, because there is not um, like a, an established practice of using biochar in agriculture or in urban areas like it's in Sweden, for example. Um, so there is a lot of interest around biochar at the moment, but uh, it is mostly uh, restricted to um, R&D activities. So here in the picture, and it has actually been going on for uh, a few years now and here in the picture you can see a field trial that was uh, done back in 2013. So it's a while that the um, research interest in Denmark is uh, um, attracted by this topic, but uh, at the moment there is no widespread and uh, practical use of, of the biochar. Um, many of the Danish university, five out of eight, they uh, carry out research um, related with biochar. We have several private companies involved in research projects and most of the ones that I mentioned, they are actually involved also in um, publicly funded uh, research projects. And there will also be more public funding uh, coming this year for specifically targeting uh, pyrolysis and biochar production. Um, I will say uh, a bit more about that later on. Um, so just to give a short overview of the research activities at our department. Uh, again, as we are a chemical engineering uh, department, uh, we have several mechanical engineers with us. We uh, work a lot with pyrolysis and gasification technologies with development and uh, optimization of the plants. We also work with the upgrading and use of bio oil and pyrolysis gas, um, for example, for the production of biofuels or methanol or uh, yeah, other products. Um, we also um, run, uh, we are also able to run um, different analysis to characterize um, the biochar properties to see, uh, for example, um, what kind of uh, um, biochar quality you can achieve with a certain process and from a certain feedstock. And we also collaborate with other DTU departments for um, investigating the application of biochar in different fields, for example, um, we have collaborated with DTU Environment, uh, where they work with biogas digestion to use biochar as an additive uh, to, um, to mitigate the ammonia toxicity. Um, and now we, are, we started a new collaboration where we work with adding biochar to uh, methane oxidation biofilters. Um, this year we will also start a collaboration with DTU Food where we will produce biochar for uh, feed additive for chickens to improve their gut microbiota and reduce um, some bacterial contamination. Um, we are involved in several projects um, regarding the uh, agricultural application of biochar. These projects are mainly in collaboration with uh, Copenhagen University with the soil science department. Uh, namely the Stabil and Bioadapt project are currently ongoing and uh, um, then the, uh, the Safe Chicken is the project related with the, um, again with the feed additive for, uh, for, bro for broilers, for chickens. Uh, and then we also have uh, a project, an UDP project in collaboration with, uh, with SkyClean, with, um, with Stistal. Um, for developing the, the two megawatt um, pyrolysis process that I talked about earlier. Um, our closest perhaps collaborators are, as I said, Copenhagen University. Um, my department has been collaborating with them for many years, even before I started my PhD. 
um, because they are, of course, the experts in soil science. So they focus uh, on different topics of research around biochar, for example, studying the fertilizer value that biochar can have, especially when produced from high phosphorus containing uh, feedstock like uh, sludge, for example. They also study the carbon stability of biochar in soil, which is very important for climate mitigation, as Cecilia mentioned earlier. They, uh, the same area of research, they also look into the, um, the effect of biochar on nitrous oxide emissions and on the water holding capacity of soils, especially uh, focusing, focusing on coarse sandy soils. There is also uh, a group that works specifically on biochar as a redox catalyst for pollutant degradation, uh, specifically for chlorinated solvents. They are also part of the Stabil and Bioadapt projects where we are involved. Uh, moving on, there is also Oros University, who has been working for many years around this topic. They, they, um, they are also involved uh, in several projects in collaboration with us. And um, they, they also focus a lot on the fertilizer value of biochar and uh, in particular on the effect on the nitrogen cycle, um, on the phosphorus retention and availability, and also on the effect of biochar on soil microbiota. Uh, here we have uh, Professor Anne Winding, which is an expert in um, soil microbiota. So she has been focusing on this for many years now. Uh, finally, we have uh, our neighbors. They are not far from the DTU campus at Rizzo, the Roskilde University. Um, at Roskilde University, they focus more on um, like um, a general assessment, like footprint studies, energy and mass flow analysis, and full LCAs of biochar systems. They also make models for optimized biomass utilization across technologies. And they also study some regulations uh, like climate credits, certification schemes, and, and governance. They're also starting up with some uh, lab research activities, uh, looking into the use uh, of biochar as a gas uh, filtration medium, for example, for removing uh, H2S from, uh, from biogas uh, when it is produced in biogas plants. They are also establishing um, small pyrolysis reactors, two pyrolysis batch, rea batch reactors. One of them will be publicly available, so whoever wants to try and pyrolyze something can go there and, and use the oven, so that's, that's very nice. They're also part of the Greater Bio project, which is an interreg project as well. Um, yeah, I have left in the slides, you can find the contact uh, from all of these research groups. So if you're, in, if you're interested, you can, of course, contact them. Um, or in any case, you can contact me and I can forward you to the, to the right person if you're interested in um, knowing more details about something that I've mentioned in this presentation. So finally, I will say that in Denmark, also uh, the government has showed, has showed uh, a lot of interest around the um, pyrolysis technologies and biochar, especially um, with the purpose to uh, reduce the um, greenhouse gases emissions in, in the agricultural sector, which is a very important sector for the Danish economy. Um, so this year they opened uh, a public call called Pyrolyse Pulen, so that's, um, that's specifically targeting uh, pyrolysis and biochar technologies. The deadline is uh, soon, so we'll see uh, if we can get some, uh, um, some funding for further research in this area. Um, the, the call is linked to the Klima Program 2021 uh, from the, so the climate roadmap of the Danish government, which states that um, uh, brown refin refineries, or uh, uh, in any case, uh, pyrolysis and biochar systems should reduce 2 million tons of CO equivalents by 2030 in, uh, in the agricultural area, in the agricultural sector. Um, so that's a lot. And that's also why they decided to, to invest um, uh, money in, in research in this field. Finally, I want to mention that uh, there is a, a Danish biochar network, which, as far as I know, is about to be started up by initiative of the Food and Bio Cluster Denmark, which I left the link in this slide. Um, the main focus of this network will be the agricultural use of biochar, and I think they plan to start the activities in April 2022. 
I've also made a slide about the Nordic PyCharm network, but Cecilia has already told you something about it, so I won't add anything. Again, if you have any questions about this or if you would like to sign up, you can visit uh, our website uh, or contact uh, me or Cecilia. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Julia. Uh, a lovely overview of what is going on in Denmark. And uh, as we can see, there are quite a few uh, research projects and collaborations and uh, so on that is happening. And as you said, um, if you uh, if you want to get into contact with any of the people mentioned in any of the slides, you can either contact me, Julia, Cecilia, Daniel, uh, or there will be a few days after today, maybe sometime next week, beginning of next week, this recording will come up uh, on uh, on a website, the project's website. You will get an email about it and then you can go through it again and see all the emails and um, websites and so on. And so, I mean, this is only just teasers about what is going on, short teasers. Um, so I, I do recommend all of you to uh, look further, deeper into what is going on. Um, and uh, yes, uh, thank you, Julia. And uh, we will uh, uh, jump ahead to uh, Daniel Rasse, uh, who is uh, representing Norway. And please uh, remember to write your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, it works in English, Danish, Norwegian or Swedish, but quite multilingual today. Um, and we will bring them up after this presentation. So please, Daniel, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Cecilia. If you're hearing me well. We are. I'm Daniel Rossi. I'm working at the uh, EBO, Norwegian Institute for Bioeconomy Research. I'm actually a specialist of soil and uh, soil carbon, and we have a whole team of people that have been working on biochar in the last 10 years from uh, different departments, actually, in EBO, both on, uh, on the biogeochemistry, the stability, this is what we started with, and then to the economy life cycle analysis. And I will say a few words about this. Um, let me share my screen. The... Um, the topic of my presentation, and I'm, I'm replacing my colleague Adam O'Toole, as you see here as the second author on, on uh, this presentation, a bit at the last minute, so I will not be able to do justice to uh, present a, a detailed overview of all the, uh, the different industry in Norway. Uh, Adam is definitely a, a better overview than me on, on this. I will can say some of I can uh, present some of this. Uh, however, but we're mostly focused on the research on biochar-based fertilizers, with um, actually mostly what we do in Norway, but a bit of a general perspective and a bit, maybe a bit more of a scientific uh, overall scientific presentation. Yes. So just to summarize, why, why do we count biochar uh, research on biochar and uh, development? Uh, it has many advantages. One is the stable, stable carbon, of course, independent from future soil use and management. That's very important. We talk to farmers, actually, that can have a method that when they stop this method, they will still get all the carbon benefit, uh, contrary to some other soil carbon sequestration method. Uh, in theory, it should be easy to report. It never is, but it should be easier than other methods. Again, other methods of soil carbon sequestration. It does not require a large amount of nitrogen and phosphorus to fix carbon in soil because of its stable nature. And that's also a big advantage uh, that shows off in, um, in LC analysis. It is synergy with bioenergy production, obviously reuse of nutrients. It reduces into emission against contrary to many soil organic carbon sequestration, which tend to increase into emission. And of course, it can be the, the start for an innov innovation based industry like we've just heard about in the two previous presentation. So to, to get biochar in the soil and getting, getting the, the industry going, we need obviously the profitability for the farmers. 
And there is two, two important elements in this, which is carbon storage and there is the agronomic value of uh, the product itself. I'm not going to go much into the carbon storage, but there is two ways we can go. We can go into the selling carbon credits, or in Norway, we've mostly been uh, exploring the subsidy way, how this government can support this. And we expect there will be partial uh, payment to the farmers uh, for storing biochar products. But in addition to this, we need agronomic values. I mean, the, the farmers are not going to put certain product at cost. They don't uh, result in good agronomic outcomes. And here we have two possibilities, saving on fertilizer or um, increasing yields. We'll just say first a word on, on some of the work we conduct on the biochar for climate mitigation uh, in Norway. This is the publication that's come actually this year, and it is a life cycle analysis, like I've also been mentioned in previous uh, presentation. Uh, this one is done for Norway, and here we have uh, taken a scenario that we will use about 35%, about one third of the forest residue in Norway towards uh, making biochar and biochar uh, fertilizer. In this analysis, you see different uh, categories over on this graph, over the, the zero line, uh, you see the emission and, and you see the, the, the positive reduction greenhouse gas emission as negative numbers. See, of course, this, the, the soil carbon sequestration is uh, very important, but then we really have to add um, to combine heat and power, or uh, even more promising, actually, to the sequestration of the bio oil to increase uh, considerably the, um, the the climate effect of these measures, and to offset on the on the on the emission side, they are, they are much smaller with different categories of using you know, increased farm aspiration, transportation, uh, feedstock collection, and fertilization. Again, so we've shown here that uh, biochar is available, uh, could offset 30% of Norwegian agricultural greenhouse gas emission. And actually, the additional carbon removal via bio oil storage could double uh, this potential. But we've really looked at biochar fertilizer. There's just many research going on in Norway, but I'm, I'm going to focus on biochar fertilizer today as a solution for improving the agronomic values. In a way, there is, there is two different ways to go. One is actually towards the efficient recycling of nutrients from waste and bioresources. Uh, this might be what is most actually relevant to do in Norway. And the other possibility is to, in, to develop improved forms of mineral fertilizer, which is very much the way they follow in China with this industry developing of biochar fertilizer, mixing, bringing your, your biochar together with your mineral fertilizer. And the question is how to do this uh, economically with good climate effect. Uh, on the first category, how to improve um, the, the use or the use of bioresource with biochar. We conducted some tests um, with digestate where we mixed we mixed uh, biochar with uh, digestate 20 or 40 percent of the volume, applied uh, this slurry and conducted this experiment in this case here with uh, green onions. And what we obtained was actually more balanced nitrate and ammonia content in the biochar and digestate uh, mix. It's a bit of a full slide, but what it shows actually that it increased the release of nitrate from the digestate without uh, increasing the uh, N2O emission. And if we consider now um, the yield effect, uh, the total yield from the control, this was only the digestate, uh, 80 was the digestate. And then we had lower high amounts of biochar that, that were added. We had greater yield when the biochar was added to the digestate. So the biochar doesn't really bring nutrients. It's the digestate bringing the nutrients. And actually even a more a pronounced result when you look at the marketable yield, because when you replace the, 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 the regular fertilization with um, just the digestate, there was a little bit of a non-significant decrease in yield, but there was a, a bigger response uh, when biochar was added uh, to the mix, so showing actually a better um, use of nitrogen here. We've also been running uh, some experiment with biochar and compost. I mean, this is this is very uh, promising, actually. 
uh, in this case, the question we had was the effect of temperature and the effect on the release of greenhouse gas uh, production. And with biochar produces 550 degrees. And the, the, the doses of biochar in this case were 5 and 17 percent. What we observe, and again, looking exclusively at uh, greenhouse gas production, so the N2O uh, and the methane, was a decrease in N2O, and this is something we've had consistently across um, experiment, that N2O is actually uh, decreased about by a factor of three. And then, the, but methane was increased at high um, use of biochar, but this also showed a faster reaction. We're actually not sure that if we let the total compost completely mature, that it would be greater uh, methane. Emission. This needs to be uh, further uh, research, but it seems that actually the low biochar amount, the 5%, was better. The second uh, field of research is on this biochar fertilizer, and it's really combining the biochar uh, with fertilizer into this kind of formulated uh, product, like you see here, this uh, these granules, pellets, or in this project called Cobra Fertile, we've been doing this. So, so we think that for the, the, the use of biochar in Norwegian agriculture, we will need to use clean uh, biomass. Uh, that will be the, the, the easiest to implement. Then you can rely on your carbon credits uh, or the feed additive is very interesting. I'm not going to cover this today, but that's a promising uh, line of product development that is actually ongoing in Norway. I'm going to speak now specifically about the effect of the biochar fertilizer, so this kind of product applied to soil. And, and the theory of, of why this should be working is that with the mineral fertilizer release large amount of uh, soluble nitrogen, and this soluble nitrogen, uh, well, in the soil, uh, can create emission of uh, nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas, obviously, and uh, leaching, and then less nitrogen is getting into the plant. But by contrast, when you apply it as a compound uh, product, which mixes the biochar um, and the fertilizer, and the idea is that the nitrogen forms like nitrate and ammonia sorbed on this biochar, it will slowly release uh, the the nitrogen in the soil, in the soil solution, which will lead to a uh, lower amount of N2O emission and lower nitrate leaching. And also it should promote some specific mechanisms like a redox and pH effect, which makes that the plants actually absorb the nitrogen better. Uh, and all this mechanism uh, resulting in greater uh, nitrogen use efficiency. So really talking here about direct nutrient retention and release through increased sorption and desorption. This is the theory. Uh, there's other effects of the biochar, of course, is direct promotion of nutrient uptake. And now there's a lot of interest uh, in the hormone-like biostimulants, if you want to call them this way, hormone-like molecules that promote the growth of plants, but also promote uh, the growth of a beneficial uh, microorganism in soils. In addition, there's, of course, the direct soil improvement, just increasing water holding capacity. Uh, in this case, we're first interested to see if we can get this high um, nitrogen uh, retention and slow release effect when you combine this. So there's been several uh, studies and we've done our own meta-analysis of uh, the literature on this and we see that we have a 17 median increase in yield when a biochar fertilizer is applied as compared to a uh, fertilizer control. There's a lot of debate in the literature why this is actually happening. Uh, again, the, the, the basic theory would be the slow release, high retention, slow release effect. Uh, other effects have been mentioned, as I said, root effect, pH increases, um, uh, biochar would be favorable for the growth of mycorrhiza, physical effects, increased nitrification, improvement of redox conditions. So we really looked into is the effect due to the, the sorption and the retention, the slow release. And th this, this might seem a bit of a theoretical question, but it's very important to know if we want to design actually concentrated biochar fertilizer product that can be used in agriculture and uh, the mechanism by which they can function and therefore give uh, the expected results and value. 
we review the sorption capacity, how much how much of these nutrients can be sorbed on biochar, and then what we saw was that um, actually biochar by itself doesn't have so much sorption capacity. The C is basically the capacity of the biochar to retain nitrogen in, in ammonia or nitrate form. It was mostly nitrate. And we see that biochar is actually lower capacity, and this is not treated biochar than some clay materials. And uh, so we conducted uh, an extensive review of this, and what we obtained is that the, the, actually the, the value is fairly low at about 5 milligram uh, ammonia nitrogen per gram biochar, and if you want to translate it into fertilization, you will need about 24 ton biochar to bring 120 kilo nitrogen per hectare. So the sorption is not sufficient, and the high values are around 20 uh, for now. There's some exceptionally high values that need to be further investigated. Absorption of, of nitrate is is lower, but even lower. But um, ammonia is really the, the most interesting. This is a little graph that symbolizes. I mean, a, a lot of the biochar literature has, has maybe not done with enough quantification, so we must rethink how much product we would apply to the field. And this little graph just so the sorption capacity of the biochar, so how much it can retain uh, ammonia in this in this case and the amount of biochar fertilizer that would be applied. So if, if you have 20 milligram, uh, which is now it's it's kind of the, the best sure product that we have, we know we can reach these values by modifying biochar, that would imply about a six ton uh, fertilizer application. But we want to be actually lower than that. We see there's different effects that uh, influence this. And uh, interestingly, the high, uh, if we control pH and ash, uh, in the biochar, you have, you have different effects, which shows that we need more research to understand how we can better uh, keep, retain uh, nitrogen in biochar fertilizer. I'm not going to go in details to this, but the, the idea is that the biochar needs uh, activation or enhancements to really be able to capture the nitrogen. And this is true, actually, whether you want to make a concentrated biochar product from mineral fertilizer or whether you want to capture uh, nitrogen sources from uh, organic wastes. This can be from manure, from slurries, from uh, compost also produced, so we've seen N2O and, and, and uh, actually ammonia. And there's many different ways to uh, conduct this activation of biochar product, but we really see this as a necessity. So we've been investigating the prospect for product enhancement, the idea, of course, that we have this biochar that is not sufficient absorbing nitrogen forms, and then it's activated and enhanced through different uh, process that we are uh, testing at this point, or some of them, and to produce uh, a product. In this case, would be actually more pellets than what is represented here to actually get the, uh, the effects that uh, are uh, desired. So a summary of the of uh, biochar fertilizer, uh, of the review specifically on biochar fertilizers on concentrated uh, product, the commercial biochar fertilizer, which we call BCF uh, in short for biochar compound or biochar based fertilizers uh, that are now produced in China. They contain about 20% biochar and this is really too little to, to really hold a large amount of nitrogen. And the effect is mostly uh, from pyrolysis derived biostimulants, which is also a very interesting field of research and also raises the question the kind of product we need to put in uh, this fertilizer. We've seen the desorption capacity of the untreated biochar is too limited uh, for BCF with high end retention and slow release, and therefore uh, it needs activation and additives. But at this point, uh, breakthrough are still needed for making really highly concentrated slow release uh, biochar fertilizer. Note that you will see in the literature uh, many articles that have produced slow release biochar fertilizer, but these have been produced using traditional or conventional uh, coating or encapsulation technology. Uh, they work. And the question here is the cost, and the question here is actually the additional benefit of the biochar in uh, this product that needs to be really demonstrated um, in this case. But if we have a high sorption biochar, then the value of the, of the 
of the product is really in the intrinsic value of the biochar itself, and we think there's a much greater gain there. But we've seen with research promising uh, venues, a biochar is very good to absorb ammonia gas, and this is um, very interesting. Again, using certain types of activated biochar, if you use just untreated biochar, you won't get nearly any effect. But with certain type of activation, it, it's really potent at absorbing ammonia gas. Very important for compost uh, facilities, which release a lot of ammonia or all the manure uh, system, again, with large ammonia emission. I mean, in Europe alone, there is 2 million ton nitrogen being lost by volatilization from manure. So this is very interesting. Uh, we've seen synergies between biochar and clay porosities. It's not only that you add your biochar porosity and clay porosity and the sum of the two, but you actually have synergies. You increase actually clay porosity and fixation when you combine it with the biochar. And this could be an economical absorption enhancement given the low cost unit of clay versus that of biochar. And also some interesting venues for physical loading of solid nitrogen forms uh, within biochar. They were not talking about sorption, was talking about putting a solid uh, nitrogen compound like urea, for example, from a molten urea into uh, biochar porosity. Uh, but research is really needed there also uh, to see um, how it can be done and, and the, the effects with some, some first papers coming on this. So my overall summary is that biochar improve end dynamics from digest state. Uh, we need to better understand the dose, uh, the application method, and uh, the biochar activation method. We've seen that biochar improve nitrogen retention in compost. Uh, this is good because it reduces N2 emission. This is something we wanted. In addition, it, it can have the largest effect on, on uh, ammonia emission, not only reducing pollution, but potentially then recycling all this nitrogen into productive fertilizer for agriculture. And there was much improvement expected from this uh, new activated biochar product. We've also seen that biostimulant effects are important when using low-dose biochar, and that this should not be uh, neglected when making such products. And anyway, it might be that in any case, even if you have more biochar in the product, you would want this biostimulant effect uh, to be forgotten. And uh, last thing, we've seen that the concentrated uh, biochar fertilizer rely on end retention and slow release effect. Uh, and then we will need a biochar super sorbents, and they are not quite yet available. We can really increase it, but not to the extent uh, that we would like at this point. And then the question, of course, will it be economically viable, uh, feasible and uh, viable if we uh, uh, do this? What will be the cost of this activation? But we've seen that uh, ammonia gas sorption, clay additive, and physical loading uh, should definitely be uh, further research. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, excellent example of what is going on in the uh, research community there. And uh, we do have a few questions in the chat, uh, but I would actually like to start with one for you, Daniel. Um, you uh, do you think that the type of biochar, uh, so the raw material or the temperature when you uh, create it or something like that, uh, does that have an effect on the absorption rates and uh, what you have been talking about? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, we know temperature is a big effect. That's for sure. Uh, actually, for ammonium sorption, Low temperature biochar are better. When I'm saying low temperature, it's probably in the 400 degrees, three to 400 degrees. Uh, if we want environmental application towards removing nitrate, again, I'm not saying that we can load a lot of nitrate on biochar. I'm not saying this to make fertilizer, but if the application is to reduce pollution from nitrate in the field, then high temperature biochar, for example, are better. At, at doing this work. So definitely. The feedstock is also very certainly plays a role. Uh, it's always a bit uh, mystifying uh, because there is, the results vary so much in the literature that sometimes it's difficult to pinpoint what is the exact effect of, of the feedstock. But actually it seems that herbaceous biochar, strangely enough, are better at sorbing a nitrogen form than wood biochar. And we need to look definitely into this to understand this better, why, why this is happening. That's a, a good answer, and it's um, that's what you usually find, isn't it? There are a lot of uh, background noise that is making the results very hard to uh, um, to read, really. The yeah, method is um, actually the first source of variability when you look yeah. into 
the, the spread of data in the literature about biotransorption of nitrogen, for example, how well it solves nitrogen, the method yeah. by which it has been measured is the first source of variability. So really work, working our way through this to really be able to sort out if it feedstock or temperature and the other factors. Indeed, indeed. And we actually have a, a, a short question there too, just to clarify, uh, what is biostimulants? Um, drop a line on that. Yeah, it's basically small molecules that, that uh, act as, as hormones. They're very close to plant hormones and they make the plant uh, grow better, especially develop more root system. Uh, and actually, it's actually known in, in, in the field of when, when you have a, a wildfire. I mean, my colleague Adam O'Toole is actually from Australia, um, a place he could speak much better than me about this place where there have enough wildfires. But in, in many plants actually susceptible to uh, pyrolyzed compounds or pyrogenic compounds. It actually mm -hmm. triggers a hormone-like uh, effect. And interestingly enough, it's not only for ecosystems that have been exposed uh, for a very long time to wildfires, but also for apparently all, all crops or many plants react to it positively. And they were talking very small amounts. So That's very interesting. Thank you for that clarification too. Uh, and um, uh, we will go back and forth between all three of you, but I will start uh, or continue rather with a question uh, about Denmark. So Julia, um, there is this uh, public call for uh, an impressive 194 million Danish crowns. And the question from the audience is, do you know uh, how and um, if the agriculture industry is approaching this, this opportunity? Yeah, I mean, perhaps I'm not the best person to ask. I'm not really, I'm more on the research side of this, but uh, I know that uh, there is interest uh, on the on the side of, of farmers and we have uh, SEGES, which is the innovation uh, uh, section of um, Landru of Podevar. And they are also involved with us in uh, in Bioshar projects, and they 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 are helping and will help us with field trials. So there is a lot of interest, mainly um, aiming at at reducing the carbon footprint of the agricultural activities. Um, we will also in this um, in the in the future work, um, we will also try to involve as much as possible the farmers to make sure that they. Um, they have uh, we exchange knowledge in an efficient way so that that this can actually be implemented. Yeah, that's that's good. Uh, and we have one more maybe open question to the three of you or who feels um, uh, bound to to have a good answer for it. But we uh, we have someone interested in uh, what the effect on on crop production is uh, of uh, biochar especially then in heavy metal contaminated sites does uh, do any of you have uh, any work uh, or any good answers on that so uh, julia or daniel well we we have a pretty extensive research but it's one of my colleagues i'm not working directly on this so i don't want to misquote but in in norway with this this uh this alun shale soil, which are naturally rich in uh, in heavy metals, and so we've been exploring the possibility of using biochars with some field trials to reduce the, this this level of contamination. Um, it Great. seems to work on certain metals, but not on others. So uh, it, the, the might also be an effect of pH. We don't know if it's sorption. Some of this is probably sorption mechanisms. It might be just be pH. Or, of course, if it's only pH, just to compare it with just liming, what would be the effect of liming? It, my colleague has done that as well, but I'm not updated on the latest results of that. Maybe if uh, if there is more questions. Uh... The, the person can can contact you and you will send yes. uh, of my colleague that. is Eric Juner and you will you will find him easily on on the Nibio website yeah. awesome Cecilia do you have anything to chip in on that question um not really I'm also not an expert but I have worked in in one project to, with the, the experts uh, uh, and yes one message is is that uh, there's a large different between different metals, uh, so you have to look specifically uh, on what metals are, are of relevance for your soil and whether biochar can be beneficial and if you need then specific properties of the biochar. 
Mm, indeed. Um, Daniel, you have a question here about uh, if you could say a few words about what is going on uh, uh, research wise uh, with biochar and different feeds for animals. And then maybe Julia, you can chip in on that too if there's anything new. But Daniel first. Yeah, we've had some, uh, some trials. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, we're mostly looking at animal health. Uh, definitely, that that is that is the big factor. Uh, it seems to be working well in different countries. There's really interest interest on the part of farmers. There is a, at least one research or several research practical research projects going on. One with biochar being produced by a company of Oplansk Bioenergy, uh, which is uh, which is this project in testing on different uh, different animals. So I think that that is really uh, promising. Uh, the fate of the biochar across the animal, whether it's stable, that's something we've looked a bit also, we, we, we can uh, trace it. We've not been clearly able to demonstrate that it would reduce methane emission at this point from the ruminants. Uh, it doesn't increase it, uh, which is nice because it, it actually increases methane production in bioreactors, which is a use, another use of biochar. But it doesn't increase it in the animal, but we've not been able to show that it actually decreases methane. But the effect on the health and then putting directly this, this biochar that goes through the animal into the field is, of course, very interesting. Yeah. Mm. And Julia, you already talked quite a bit about uh, research going on about in feed uh, using. Um, uh, yes, uh, I have not uh, actually taken part in any trials yet. Um, I have worked on a project where the, the feedstock to produce biochar was uh, residues from a green biorefinery, so which is a biorefinery process meant to produce protein juice. So the idea was to use the residue to make, to produce biochar from them, and then the most obvious use would be to then uh, add it to the to the feed. So um, we have tried to, to make it so that it would be, uh, so we activated it to make it more porous, hopefully so that it could uh, be more effective in binding toxins, for example. But um, this year we will start off with a new project and this time would be more focused on the on the animals. So there will actually be trials on on uh, on, on chicken farms. And um, according to the literature, this should help the the, the gut microbiota and reduce uh, some specific bacteria contamination in the chicken meat. Um, so we hope that works. And um, yeah, I just want to say that, I mean, the the practice of using charcoal in animal feed is a very old one, but uh, right now we actually don't really know exactly why that works, but um, apparently it has been working for uh, for a while now. So it's it, I think it's a pretty promising um, uh, application and I'm happy we can work a bit more on this. Mm, indeed, indeed. Um, and then we have a question about uh, using microwave assisted pyrolysis technique versus the conventional method for heating biomaterials. Um, do any of you have worked with that and do you have any results um, one versus the other? Not no. really. <laughs> Not a specialist no. of pyrolysis. I know it's done in, in Norway with a company, uh, VAO um, Technologies, uh, which was uh, developed from ScanShip. Uh, that company has a power, um, microwave pyrolyzer uh, and use it for waste treatment. So I'm a bit less involved in this, but I think it's a very also promising venue because you can treat more wet biomass. That, that can be an advantage. I don't know, I don't know to which level it can be wet, but uh, it, it seems very interesting to, to treat sludge and this kind of products. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. And I think um, that might be a for, way forward too, to uh, at least explore uh, using microwave assisted pyrolysis, definitely. Uh, you have both, uh, all, all three of you talked a lot about um, different uh, collaborations, um, both with agriculture and other uh, private companies and, and uh, different branches of the industry. Uh, do you, and, and I think we will go in turn so all three of you can answer, do you see any opportunities that have not yet been fully used? Do you see any, any industries or companies that you would like to use more that they would use 
biochar. Um, Cecilia, maybe, if you have any thoughts about it. Oh, yeah. I think we are still very early in biochar development and that there are lots of opportunities uh, in, in various uh, uh, sectors. Um, there is emerging research in forestry uh, with, with promising results uh, using it in, 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 uh, in plants, but also in, in forest soils. Um, the integration of various wastes to produce biochar for specific uses um, and developing specific product products. I, I, I think there's so much to be done. <laughs> um. Definitely. Definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, please chip in again if you come up with uh, with more ideas there. Uh, Julia, do you um, think there are any untapped collaboration opportunities? I mean, I have the feeling actually in these years I've been working in the field, there is actually a lot of interest from many different areas. So let's say I never felt like I was missing or we were the, the research field was missing some 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 attention or uh, so we are contacted by not only agri uh, farmers but also um, for example people interested in making concrete out of biochar or making adsorbents so I think that at least in for what I can see, uh, there is um, quite a um, uh, diverse um, landscape of uh, people interested in the field. And I cannot really say that we are missing to reach out to someone perhaps uh, that could be more on the policy side, that we still have some, uh, um, some um, gaps there, but also in that direction, uh, there are steps being made. Uh, also at European level and so on. So we hope uh, that could improve in the near future. Mm. Good answer. Good answer. Daniel, do you have any thoughts on the topic? Yeah, I think the situation in Norway is pretty much the same. And we've also studied projects in forestry. So that's uh, thanks, Cecilia, to mentioning this because that's important. I'd forgotten to mention it. Uh, that's an important uh, part, possibly, with forest fertilization. So we've been trying some of these fertilizer. I think that the filters also filter. I think, Julia, you mentioned the filter technology uh, for the methane. So that's uh, that's something very interesting. Also for the ammonia, it can be uh, very relevant. So this filter technology in agriculture. Uh, and then I think about the policy, of course, but reaching the larger industry, I think it has been uh, and it's great to have pioneering industry on board. Uh, they are mostly SMEs and I mean, for collaboration and research project is fantastic for development of the field uh, as well. Uh, it might be that even larger industry would eventually be uh, interested to really upscale. If we're thinking carbon sequestration, how do we upscale to really large uh, fertilizer uh, companies or wood processing companies? So really this integration between the, the innovation companies and the larger traditional companies, I think, would, would really help this upscaling. Mm, indeed. Uh, the whole industry needs to put in an effort to uh, to scale it up really we uh have a question or more like maybe like a comment um of the um there is the the question of increasing or changing the uh effects on yield uh, on crops and um, nutrient use efficiency and so on and that uh, we all know it depends on the type of soil that you apply the biochar to do any of you three know if there is a sort of summary or a view of the characterization of soils where different you get different yields or different um, impacts from from effects from biochar? Yeah, there's been a couple of reviews. There is one from uh, Ye et al. in 2020, mm. where they look at this effect. I think they got a plus 15 percent effect 
but looking across across uh, all all uh, biomes and all, all all agricultural systems, different regions of the world, we know biochar works better in tropical region if it's really mm. pure biochar for for effects. But that was really biochar fertilizer, biochar plus uh, fertilizer plus biochar compared to the control. And that's mm. very important because a lot of the literature has been testing biochar, maybe biochar with an additive versus no control. So you can, you can get all any kinds of fantastic responses. But if you add a fertilizer in addition, uh, you will get, of course, a big response if, versus no fertilizer. So you need the right control. But even when looking at the right control, you, you still get this plus uh, 15%. And there was a paper by Schmidt et al. Uh, last year that it argued that we get some of this effect also uh, in temperate uh, regions mm. and 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 the, to me the, the additional question to this is what do you gain in addition by combining both you know do how how well do you need to combine this is what i was trying to address in my presentation and the technology to really if you can really fix the fertilizer on the biochar can you have this slow release effect because you might not really increase yield or you might increase the somewhat but you might really save on the nitrogen fertilizer and, and decrease on the fertilizer make it more efficient I think we're mostly looking at increased efficiency. Mm, indeed, and as we as we said before, uh, the results are always uh, tricky to read when you have uh, fertilizer and biochar and the control and you uh, mix. Um, you don't really know where the effect came from. Uh, so, so I at least think that it would be very interesting to do more field trials and more research in the in our soils and in our soil types here in Sweden, Denmark, Norway, um, to get you know know what to say to the agricultural businesses or farmers. Uh, do we have an increased yield or do we not have an increased yield? Um, the answer, it depends, is um, no, a hard one to receive sometimes. It, it was my last slide, but I removed it. It was more <laughs> field trials. <laughs> there we go. We, we are in agreement, agreement on that. Um, so I know we have today with us quite a few um, people that are looking for more small scale um, both maybe applications and production systems. Um, and it's also a question that came up here in the chat. Is there any help to get if you are not the big Stockholm Exergy plant or the, the big Oplandske plant um, to if you want to start? Uh, it's maybe not a very researcher question, but um, where would you start if you wanted to do a small scale uh, paralysis in business. Is there anything you uh, maybe maybe to switch it to to a knowledge question? What do you really need to know uh, if you were to to boil down all the knowledge that you are sitting on and all the research? What do you um, what would you recommend someone to read or to know uh, before starting? Perhaps uh, I can chip in here. Um, I think I, it, this question uh, makes me think of uh, something that I heard from Hans-Jörg Glerkenmüller, who's from the European biochar industry. And uh, he said something in a, in a webinar some time ago that I think it's very good to keep in mind, that if you want to produce biochar, you actually have to think that you will have some sort of a, of an um, of a, actually of an energy plant. So you will not only produce biochar, but you will also produce uh, heat and and gas. And uh, so if you do not need this energy, uh, then it is better to think about just buying the biochar. If you only want the biochar, then you can buy it from someone else. And if, in mm. any case, it is very important that the biochar is certified. Um, for example, with the EBC standard, so that you are sure and safe that it is not contaminated, uh, then the production process is a clean one, and then you, you have a high quality biochar. Um, yeah, I think that's the most important. And then, as far as I know, there are many small companies uh, coming up right now that may be able to offer um, small scale pyrolysis plants. But uh, mm. yeah, that's what I think is the most important. 
indeed. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I'm thinking we do have five more minutes before the webinar is uh, over. Uh, and uh, and I have um, uh, a final question for the three of you. Uh, and that is, what do you see as the next big question in biochar research? What is the next big issue, question or challenge that research needs to uh, um, get their hands dirty and solve or uh, um, come up with an answer for? Uh, we can start maybe with uh, Cecilia. Oi. Um, <laughs> Big question to start with. <laughs> yes, uh, I could start where, where I'm working and, and uh, still struggling. Uh, I think we have quite some understanding now from life cycle assessments on the climate impact of biochar, but how to communicate and use that knowledge and make it available to decision makers. Um, and really how to get actors and um, yeah, if you want a big question, is how to grow biochar in a sustainable way to get the pieces together with policy, with business models, with the technology and the science, with the different actors in the value chain. Um, that's mm. the big question. <laughs> then within all of this, um, there, there's, I mean, there's so many interesting questions and, and opportunities. Indeed, indeed, to, to make the market as a whole, or the industry as a whole, to really function, to really work from cradle to grave, I guess. Um, yes, mm. and to, to have business and the environmental impacts to go together, so that it's the, the environmentally beneficial systems that expand and grow. Mm. Mm, indeed. Uh, Daniel, uh, any questions about that? Are the biggest issues or challenges or questions for research in biochar now and a few years in uh, in the future? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think if you look at that, I totally agree with Cecilia. I mean, if, if it's research in the in the wider sense, mm. then I think it's building this this value chains. How do we build profitable value chain? We definitely need that. And and I think how do we combine uh, the carbon credits? which I think in many cases will be necessary. I mean, it, it all started with storing carbon. It's my, my specialty, but started storing carbon in soils, right? It also decreases N2O. How do we combine this in a model, um, payment for this service, with the value of the biochar itself and making more valuable product like a biochar fertilizer or a feed for an animal? So how do how do we make this these models? I think that that's really what is important for the development of uh, of the industry, and that we keep communicating also the science results when, when when we get them, so that the industry knows you know where where in which direction to go, what is likely to work, what is not likely to work. Mm, indeed, and uh, Julia. Um, yeah, I totally, totally agree with Cecilia and Daniel. And again, I think that uh, to make this uh, value chain possible, uh, we will need uh, like sound policies and regulations and um, um, robust certification system for the biochar so that we make sure um, of the quality of the biochar that is used. And I would add that uh, perhaps something that I see missing again as we already mentioned before is more field trials, large scale trials and long term trials which are um, hard and expensive to do so we do not have so many of them and we would need more. Mm, indeed and I think that is a very good closing remark. Uh, we do need a full value chain uh, with a biochar and the business case and the agriculture and uh, we need more of course results and I think researchers and universities um, have a very big and important role to play uh, to bring biochar forward really and um, the time is actually up and uh, uh, I know that I will keep this um, 
this webinar open for a few more minutes uh, if you want to chat among yourselves or uh, get something from the um, emails or something like that from the chat. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for coming and joining us and speaking today, Julia, Cecilia and Daniel. And uh, thank you all of you who have participated and listened. And I think um, uh, that this is a great networking uh, opportunity as well. Please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me or any of the speakers or any names that you recognize in the uh, in the chat room here. And um, I hope to see you uh, next time we have a Biochar Network. Uh, opportunity. So thank you for today. Thank you very thank much, you. Cecilia. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yes. Thank you, Cecilia.